Elite warriors charged with the fateful mission of penetrating the most elaborate and deadly defenses known to man. The defenders must hold their ground at any cost. From historic sieges of the ancient world to the lightning-fast conflicts of today, the eternal struggle of aggressor versus defender. Assaulting the Fortress. One of man's primal needs has always been to protect himself against an armed attack. From caves to towering castles, soldiers have often sought shelter behind the hardened walls of fortifications. Here they found protection, but that safety came with a price, for they had lost the option of mobility. The battle between aggressor and defender had begun, and a new type of engagement was born, siege warfare. Siege warfare is based on a few simple principles. When you are stronger, you attack. When you are weaker, you retreat. The defense relies on difficult terrain or a fortress to strengthen its resistance. But now the issue becomes more complex. The attacker is left with a problem to solve. To surround the defender and wait, to assault head on, or to maneuver around. The defense may be able to counter one or more of these moves depending on its strength. And as the number of possible outcomes begins to skyrocket, it is easy to see why military sieges have fascinated both experts and casual observers for so long. There's been great examples in history of sieges, and fortifications have been successful or not successful based on various designs, based on how well they were defended, and based on how well the attacking force was organizing its tactics to try to destroy the fortress. Perhaps the best known siege of the ancient world occurred at the city of Troy. Legend has it that Ulysses and several of his fellow soldiers hid in the belly of a huge wooden horse, which was left for the Trojans as a present. The Trojans brought it inside the city walls, and that night Ulysses and his men crept out, opened the gate for their allies, and destroyed the city. From the Trojan horse to the amazing breaches of today, the military engineer has had an essential role to play in the history of sieges. Sappers or engineers have been an integral part of armies since the classical world. They had two primary responsibilities. One was building fortification, and the other was destroying fortification. Engineers with their specialized equipment, a very good thing to have around because they normally have a solution to your problem. Combat engineering was an important part of the Roman army. In fact, the Romans built a fort every night when on campaign. They would stop several hours before dusk, and each man would take out his shovel, dig a ditch, erect a parapet, build a palisade, and the legion would sleep in the safety of its fortress for the night. There's a great science involved in developing good fortifications, and a science also or an art, if you will, on how to attack these uh, fortresses. Gradually, castles became the primary means of governing territory, and therefore the targets of assaults when attempting to capture land. The first castles were wooden structures surrounded by moats, but wood was vulnerable to attack by flaming arrows, heavy stone catapult projectiles, and wood eventually rotted as well. Engineers then began building towering stone castles which dominated the landscape. That is, until the development of gunpowder tilted the scales back in favor of the offense. It was with the introduction of effective artillery in the 15th and 16th centuries that the art of combat engineering began to change. Fortress walls, which previously had been high to provide a dominant platform for archers, could now easily be battered down by the artillery. A new science of fortress engineering began. Fortress walls were now thicker and lower. Similarly, a new science to breach the walls of the fortress was developed. 
the term sapper was introduced to describe the engineers who dug trenches ever closer toward the fortress walls. Artillery was brought forward in the protection of the sap or trench until the castle walls could be hit directly at close range. Once the fortress had been breached, the infantry would storm into the opening. Alternatively, miners might be employed who would dig a tunnel beneath the fortress walls, create a chamber, pack it with gunpowder, and explode it beneath the fortress walls, also hoping to create a breach. As the constant struggle between the attacker and the defender continued, a French engineer named Vauban integrated the defensive principles of the time into a coherent and formidable system. The characteristic design of a Vauban fort was that it was star-shaped. It was trying to minimize the number of straight walls, the number of wide, uh, long, flat surfaces uh, that were open to the enemy. That allows you to get the enemy inside basically a, a trapped area. So no matter where the enemy attacked the wall, he was being assaulted from three sides versus one side. And that was the beauty of uh, Vauban's engineering. Once again, though, the offense had an answer. The technology of the Industrial Revolution produced stronger metals, which in turn created more effective artillery. The guns were larger, more accurate, and the shells now packed an explosive punch. With the new shells, they had an explosive payload. One shell hitting a brick or masonry structure could create far, far more damage than the old solid shot. The only way to overcome this was to use earth and other structures to actually absorb that shock of those explosions. So therefore, fortifications went virtually underground. So when you looked at an old fort, an old castle, you saw a brick structure above the ground. You look at a modern fortification, you see virtually nothing. All you see is an earth bank. The effects of these new technologies, both offensive and defensive, would be tested in the very first battle of World War I. Liège uh, in Belgium controls the Meuse River. The Meuse is a, a fairly significant obstacle if you're going to invade Belgium. Liège was surrounded by a series of fortifications on hills, and the German army studied this problem before the war, and they developed a 42-centimeter siege gun. They called it Big Bertha. This uh, siege mortar fired a tremendous projectile, and because it was a mortar, the trajectory was such that the shell came straight down and penetrated the ground to a, a tremendous distance, then exploded and just destroyed these forts. Uh, they were concreted forts covered with earthworks, but they were fixed in place, uh, and anything that's fixed in place, an artilleryman can hit. The German army swept into France, but their attempt to outmaneuver the French soon began to slow after hundreds of miles of marching. The French reinforcements met the German army head on in the open fields outside Paris. The advance was halted and both sides wondered how long the stalemate would last. The trenches to start with were rather shallow. They didn't think they were gonna be in these trenches too long. And they would go on these massive offensives and people would be gunned down in massive numbers with machine guns. The defender once again reigned supreme. The first trenches, dug in late 1914, soon became elaborate fortifications which were impossible to penetrate. Dugouts, observation posts, bomb-proof shelters were erected to protect the infantrymen in the front line. Dug-in machine guns swept the no-man's land between the two opposing front lines with machine gun fire. It was virtually suicidal for any infantryman to move forward. When we got there, the trenches amazed us because we had never built any trenches. We had only dug foxholes to avoid Indian arrows. So we were fascinated by these wonderful trenches. I had, by this time, wooden slab uh, floors or sidewalks down in the bottom of the trenches. And we even had them going out into the uh, tertiary trenches, which we call observation trenches. And these observation trenches were 
dug out at angles from the main trench, and you had to have them because they were beyond the wire. The strategies for assaulting the enemy's trench line had also become more complex. The flower of the British Army, the flower of the French and German armies was wasted in mass attacks. We attacked Indian style. We would have possibly a squad or a platoon go over at one at a time and get through the wire and get organized out into the no man's land. And then we would have the scouts who had reconnoitered the enemy wire and we knew where the entrances to their avenues were. We reassemble in no man's land into attacking waves and we go in in waves, never all at once. And if the first wave was successful, we would have a backup wave to go right on over the trench and attack the reserve trenches in the back. Perhaps the most famous siege of World War I occurred in the trenches and forts surrounding the city of Verdun, where even today, the earth still bears the scars of battle. But the Battle of Verdun was not fought in order to gain territory. Instead, the German generals attacked Verdun because they knew the French army would never relinquish this historic city. My area of combat for several months was in the area around Verdun. Verdun was the gateway to Paris in those days. And the German army began in 1916 a great drive. They marshaled all of their strategic and tactical assets. It was at Verdun that the German high command decided they were going to bleed the French army to death. On February the 21st, a massive bombardment of Verdun began. More than two million shells landed in the first two days. And five days after the opening of the bombardment, German stormtroopers captured the crucial fort of Durmont on the east side of the Nice River. The German army captured several smaller forts as well, but the French never retreated, and eventually they reclaimed much of the ground they had initially lost. The fighting became very, very horrific, very, very close at hand, and it used all of the modern weapons that had developed in World War I, gas, flamethrowers, uh, hand grenades, machine guns, uh, effective uh, uh, mines and, and artillery barrages. And uh, it took out vast numbers of soldiers on a grand scale that hadn't been seen before. The campaign goes on and on, and it's a massive meat grinder operation where the, uh, the German army sustains uh, 400,000 casualties of the French, something like 500,000 casualties in this, in this horrific battle. Verdun became a siege in a modern sense, primarily because it seized the French and German uh, political leaders as political objectives. Unbelievable expenditure in life and material was wasted on this one particular part when other military objectives could have possibly gained more for one side or the other. But this is because war is not just a matter of mathematical equations. War is a human endeavor. It involves the emotions and the human psyche. And sometimes those things gain predominance over the military objectives. And therefore, Verdun became a typical example of how horrible it can be. Eventually, the tank arrived on the battlefield. The first tanks were slow and unreliable, but they protected the infantry from machine gun fire and cleared the way by crushing the barbed wire in front of the German trenches. The terrible war of attrition finally came to an end, but once again, the future roles of the attacker and the defender were unclear. The French draw a lesson from Verdun that 
If you can have a system of forts with interlocking uh, field fortifications in between the forts, and then a mobile force behind that to mop up any penetrations of that, that's the way the future is going to be. So they build the Maginot Line in the 1930s. 62 miles of tunnels linked the forts of the Maginot Line. Emplacements deep underground with barracks, ammunition storage facilities, lifts, and huge gun emplacements. By designing the Maginot Line, getting in these concrete fortifications and other field fortifications, what the French were trying to do was to preserve later generations. And they, they thought that this was the way that battles in the future were going to be fought, that the defense had once again become ascendant. And they just misinterpreted their data. What the French had truly misjudged was the Germans' ability to conduct rapid mechanized warfare. As World War II began, the combined forces of the Blitzkrieg launched Germany into an age of maneuver warfare. Technology surpassed the Maginot Line, and the Germans come up with the, the concept of mobile warfare. You can put massive numbers of troops in wheeled and tracked vehicles and take them around. In order to avoid the Maginot Line, the German army once again sprinted into Belgium as they had in World War I. There they were confronted with another Belgian fort, this time, the imposing Ibn Imal. Uh, Ibn Imal sits east of Liège, and it's one of these things which you have to take to cross the Albert Canal. So it was very important to the Germans, who were now using this lightning war concept, to grab roads and bridges, in particular, over the Albert Canal, so that they could drive on into Belgium. Ibn Imal controlled one of the very important crossing sites that the Germans had to have. They knew that they had to take the fortress somehow if they wanted to have a lightning drive into Belgium. They also knew that the fortress would be almost impossible to take if they tried to storm it. German engineers in small assault boats crossed the canal under heavy enemy fire, and a second silent attack came from an unexpected direction. Paratroops in gliders came down right on top of the fortress, uh, were able to uh, brush across the opposition that was on top of the fortress with very little uh, uh, effort because the Belgians had not planned to defend the fortress from the top. Here they met the engineers who had made it across the canal by boat. They then placed shape charges on the turrets and destroyed all of the guns on top of the fortress, making the fortress totally useless. Even a mall is important because it marks the first time that the shape charge is used. It's a well-known principle in physics that if you direct the energy of an explosive charge, you can direct it into a jet which can penetrate armor to great depth. The bottom line was that 80 German paratroopers took out a major portion of the Belgian defenses, and that was primarily because of the, the training, the planning, and the audacity that the Germans showed in attacking this fortress in a new way. By June of 1940, northern France, including Paris, had fallen to the Nazis. England readied itself for a possible invasion. In fact, the British developed several innovative defense measures. In certain parts of the channel, oil would be released from pipelines located on the ocean floor. This would then be chemically ignited to form a wall of fire just off the coast. Another barrier of fire awaited invaders on the beach, and yet another further inland as well. Ironically, though, the German army, master of the Blitzkrieg, assumed a defensive posture for the time being. They were stretched too thin to mount a massive invasion of England. Instead, they began construction of coastal fortifications to hold the ground they had already captured.
The Eastern Front held the key to victory. If the Nazis were going to launch an invasion of England in the West, they had to crush Russia, where the majority of their troops were deployed. But two Soviet cities in particular, Leningrad and Stalingrad, could not be overrun. The siege of Leningrad perhaps best represents how siege warfare had changed over the years. Rather than attack a single fort, the Germans were faced with a massive city, surrounded by earthworks, surrounded by strong points, and held by four Soviet armies. In the siege of Leningrad, the Russian army mobilizes tremendous numbers of civilians to go out and dig anti-tank ditches and they dig massive anti-tank ditches so that the Germans can't employ their armor around Leningrad. At this point, Hitler ordered his army to halt. Rather than attempt a direct assault on the city, he ordered his commanders to flatten the city using artillery and using aircraft. The siege of Leningrad wore on for over 900 days. Food and water were often scarce, but crucial supply routes were kept open, including an ice road built over the frozen Lake Ladoga in the winter. Leningrad is in a fortuitous geographical position in that you have the, the Gulf of Riga coming in on one side, the uh, lake on the other, and Finland behind you. The city was far too large, and the Germans were never able to deploy enough troops against the city to totally cut it off from reinforcement and resupply. Virtually throughout the 900-day siege, the Soviet defenders were able to receive reinforcements, ammunition, and foodstuffs, which were able to keep the city going. The siege of Stalingrad did not last as long as that of Leningrad, but it was witness to some of the most bitter fighting on the entire Eastern Front. The battle for Stalingrad is a classic example of how urban areas are now used and turned into modern fortresses in battle. Stalingrad also illustrated the German army's failure once again to completely cut off the defenders' incoming supplies. What the Germans didn't do here was surround Stalingrad first and then try to reduce it. What they did was they broke into the city immediately, gained a foothold, and then tried to expand the foothold. At the same time, the Russians were on the other bank of the Volga, and they were continuing to send reinforcements through. With both sides pouring in more troops, the fighting in the narrow city streets became increasingly ferocious. As the Germans continued to fight for the city, the Russians turned every building in the city into a small fortress. The fights over the red tractor factory, the fights over some of the other major buildings in Stalingrad are legend. The battle became a meat grinder, very similar to what happened in the Battle of Verdun. Finally, in January of 1943, the German army, over 1,500 miles from its homeland, ran out of reinforcements. Soviet counterattacks surrounded the German troops. The northern and southern Russian armies rejoiced in the fields outside of Stalingrad, knowing that the German forces were trapped inside the city. The attacker, had now become the defender. But Hitler was not about to admit defeat. Hitler decided there was only one option that he would not allow anyone to withdraw. He told the defenders of Stalingrad that they would fight to the last man, and they in fact fought uh, a very, very difficult battle, not to the last man, but until their effectiveness was no longer anything that could stop the Soviet army. And so they surrendered, and the, uh, the Soviets won one of the greatest victories of the war in Fortress Stalingrad. But the Eastern Front was not the only site of dramatic sieges in World War II. In Italy, the mountainous terrain provided the German army with effective natural defensive positions. The Allies slowly moved up the boot of Italy towards Rome, often depending on mules where trucks and tanks could not go. But their advance was halted at Cassino, a town dominated by a 6th century mountaintop abbey located some 60 miles southwest of Rome. You could see for 8, 10, 12 miles on a clear day without any problems. So any movement in the valley floor could be observed by the Germans 
on the mountaintop. So that uh, taking the town of Casino or the monastery itself, you would be taking or trying to defeat the Germans at their strongest point. A brigade of the American 5th Army attempted an offensive, but they were quickly beaten back by the German artillery and mortar fire, which poured down from the hills. Many Americans believed that the German soldiers directing this devastating fire, the artillery spotter, were operating from within the abbey itself, a location supposedly off limits to any military personnel. I've been told since that, that the monastery was vacant, that there was no uh, military forces there, but I'm convinced that they were. In fact, we were able to see reflections of binoculars if you attempted to move during the day, if you, if you were not camouflaged, uh, the Germans could literally pick you off like shooting fish in a barrel. Uh, they had to have been there because it was the focal point. It was the center of that defensive position. The Abbey had not been attacked due to the religious and historical respect the Allies had for the monument. But after several months of fighting and many thousands of casualties, a decision was reached to reduce this probable German stronghold. You had no choice but to blast it off the face of the earth. I can recall, even today, the feeling of elation. It started in the morning, a gray overcast, cloudy day, and we could see coming out of the south uh, these tiny specks, and then we knew they were bombers, our heavy planes, and as they approached the monastery, uh, it, it filled the sky like, like flies or like huge birds. It, the sky was just full of our planes. And as they crossed over the area where they could begin to drop their bombs on that mountain, the earth rumbled. It just shook like an earthquake for probably two hours. It was just a happy, happy day for everybody there because we could see it disintegrate. We understood later that they were 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 feet deep inside the mountain in these caves playing cards, sleeping, just waiting for the bombing to end. Later on attack, trying to maneuver back up that mountain, the Germans came out of those caves underneath that monastery and cut us to pieces. It was unbelievable. Ironically, reducing the town and the monastery to rubble made it easier for the German paratroopers who were defending the position. Even though it was reduced to rubble, the high ground was still there. It still offered the vantage point, and now all that rubble was turned into a fortress by the Germans. Eventually, the Allied commanders realized Casino could not be taken by a direct assault. Ultimately, it was taken, but it was taken by virtue of another action by making the invasion of a place called Anzio, south of Rome. The purpose of that, of course, was to cut off the supplies to Casino. The amphibious landing at Anzio stalled at first, but the Americans finally broke out from the beach and the Germans were forced to retreat from Casino. Nevertheless, this ancient mountaintop stronghold had taken a heavy toll. It was a position that we should never have attempted to have taken by frontal assault. I'm not a tactician, I know nothing of strategy, but I know that you just don't simply throw all of your forces at something that is that impenetrable. In the first days of June, 1944, the Allies made final preparations to invade Hitler's Atlantic Wall, or Fortress Europe, as the defenses along the French coast had come to be known. The Atlantic Wall was a well-designed, complex obstacle. It included many different devices that were designed to destroy landing craft, and then kill soldiers when they hit the beaches. Once you got onto the beaches, there were mines, barbed wire, up to the point where Germans would then have their machine gun pits and their anti-tank gun pits and their cannons. Fortunately for the Allies, the German army was operating under several disadvantages by 1944, which allowed the Allies to systematically isolate and then reduce the defenses surrounding the Atlantic Wall. The Germans had two major disadvantages by 1944. The Luftwaffe had been virtually swept from the skies, and the Allies enjoyed total air superiority. Similarly, the German Navy had been reduced to a few submarines and a few E-boats operating in the Channel in the North Sea. 
neither force would be adequate to deter an Allied invasion. The Allied plan for the assault of Fortress Europe involved a sequence that had first airborne and glider troops trying to isolate the battlefield. These troops landed the night before at key road junctions, at key river bridges. Their mission was to seize these areas and block enemy reinforcements from getting to the beachheads. The next day, a huge naval bombardment prepared the beaches. The Allied Navy expended thousands and thousands of shells against German gun emplacements. In addition to that, the Air Forces tried to also slow enemy reserves, destroy key bridges, and pulverize uh, enemy formations that could be observed. So first, the beachheads areas were uh, isolated, then they were prepared, and finally the beach assault itself occurred. The Allies landed at five different beaches on the Normandy Peninsula. Gold, Juneau, Sword, and the American landing sites, Omaha and Utah. The fight to uh, get to Omaha Beach was the worst. There we landed against uh, a very well-prepared uh, enemy that was defending uh, from very good bunkers that had not been destroyed, and we took tremendous casualties on the beach. Finally, however, through the courage of uh, many fine soldiers and engineers who went forward to blow up the obstacles, we were able to break through at Omaha Beach and uh, finally get up to the uh, beach wall and then continue to move through, and so the uh, actions at Omaha were successful. At the end of June the 6th, five Allied divisions were firmly ashore and almost 50 divisions were waiting in England to reinforce them. By the end of June 1944, one million Allied troops had poured through the Normandy beachhead. Eventually, all of France was liberated and the Allies were closing in on one of Germany's final lines of defense. The last obstacle toward the Allies' advance into Germany was the Siegfried Line. A series of tank obstacles, ditches, anti-personnel mines, and concrete barriers known as Dragon's Teeth, which were protected by bunkers, machine gun nests, and anti-tank guns. The Siegfried Line could have posed a major threat to the Allied advance if the German army had kept heavy artillery and small arms fire on the advancing troops. But the Germans were outnumbered on the verge of defeat and therefore could not counter the Allies' firepower advantage. The Siegfried Line was demolished by a combination of Allied bombing, artillery strikes, and combat engineers using satchel charges and other means of demolition. Meanwhile, the Russians were rapidly advancing in the east and actually reached Berlin before the Western Allies. The city, which the Nazis said would hold out longer than Leningrad, fell within a matter of only a few days. Hitler's dream of a thousand-year Reich was finally over, and now the German people were left to pay for their leader's demonic aspirations. In the years following World War II, the power of the atomic bomb was never tested in battle, although its destructive effect on any existing fortifications appeared obvious. Instead, small regional conflicts erupted in faraway places like Korea. But the next great siege of the modern era did not occur until the end of 1953, where the French struggled against the communist Viet Minh at a place called Dien Bien Phu. The Battle of Dien Bien Phu is a classic example where the person who wanted to trap an enemy became trapped instead. The French wanted to win a great conventional victory against the Viet Minh, their enemy, the Vietnamese communists. Tired of years of guerrilla warfare, the French decided they would try and lure the communists out into a battle in the open. Three battalions of French paratroopers landed in November, overran the small communist garrison, and began fortifying the village and improving the airfield. Over the next few weeks, the garrison was reinforced to a total of 15,000 French regulars and Vietnamese loyal to the French. The French forces believed they held a firepower advantage which could stop any communist attack. But their initial estimates were soon proved wrong. The Vietnamese had been training their army. They had been re-equipped with uh, weapons from China. They had increased their firepower, and they had also realized the French plan. Uh, General Giap, the uh, leader of the Vietnamese army, uh, planned the operation 
to be a battle of annihilation. General Chiao directed his assault against the airfield, and in March 1954, it was overrun. Resupply was now only possible by parachute, and many of the transport aircraft flying in were shot down by communist Vietnamese gunners, and many of the supplies, instead of falling in French hands, actually landed in the communist lines. By May of 1954, the French garrison was on the point of starvation, virtually out of ammunition, and finally fell to an overwhelming communist Vietnamese assault. The French defeat at Dien Bien Phu was an important political victory for the communists, which ended French involvement in the region. The treaty signed on July 20th, 1954, not only ended French rule in the area, but also called for the formation of communist North Vietnam, which in turn led to American military involvement in the Vietnam War in 1965. The fighting in Vietnam was mostly characterized by guerrilla warfare in the jungles, small groups of infantry and mechanized forces searching for and then engaging the enemy. But Vietnam was also the site of a large conventional battle, the siege of the American compound at Khe Sanh in the misty hills near North Vietnam. Khe Sanh was a strategic city in Quang Chai province, dominating Highway 9, a crucial resupply route. Garrisoned by 5,000 United States Marines in January 68, the city was surrounded by up to 20,000 North Vietnamese regulars. The Vietnamese communists were touting the slogan that Khe Sanh would be another Dien Bien Phu. General Giap, the man who had planned the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, was supposedly the man who was planning the Battle of Khe Sanh. Uh, the United States saw Khe Sanh as a great opportunity to win a firepower battle over, over its enemy. And this was the same concept that the French had initially had with Dien Bien Phu. However, despite the surface similarities between Khe Sanh and Dien Bien Phu, the two battles were actually quite different for a number of reasons. One important factor was that the Marines occupied the high ground surrounding the compound. I think we needed to hold the high ground. If they'd have taken the hill we were on, and we were the hill they apparently tried to take the most, Hill 861, if they'd have taken that, they would have had 881 cut off from Quezon, and that uh, air flights wouldn't be able to go right over the top of the thing because they would set up their anti-aircraft positions on that. I think it was important to hold those hills. In addition, the Americans, unlike the French years earlier, did indeed hold a firepower advantage over the North Vietnamese, both from artillery on the ground and, more importantly, in the air. We had total uh, air superiority and total uh, uh, command of the air. Our fighters and our fighter bombers flew countless missions against the North Vietnamese Army, uh, just pulverizing the hills around Khe Sanh. There are massive numbers of B-52 strikes. Each B-52 can carry 72 750-pound bombs. And I know from personal experience, when, when you see one of these strikes, it's, it's uh, awe-inspiring. I recall looking up in the air, trying to see if I could spot the airplanes, the B-52s dropping the bombs. I could not see the B-52s, but I heard the bombs cascading down, and they would just make a horrendous roar you could hear for miles and miles. The American superior firepower not only stopped many communist attacks, but also allowed the critical aerial resupply efforts to continue, although the airstrip at Khe Sanh was by no means a safe place to be. The food, water, and ammunition brought in by the transport crews were the lifeblood of Khe Sanh, and the Marines on the ground certainly realized the sacrifices that these pilots were making. I believe that the, the pilots that flew into there had to have quite a bit of courage. I recall at one point when I was filling sandbags with my, my squad members, and one of them looking up and yelling, hey, look at that. And I looked around in time to see a Silver C-130 flying in, and it was fully engulfed in flames. And I saw it go down on the runway. Apparently, the crew had been killed, but uh, I can vividly remember seeing that plane come around on fire. 
and then hitting the runway. Despite the frequent tragedies, the supplies kept coming. The bombers continued to unleash their fury, and the Marines held fast. The compound was battered, but it had never been in serious danger of falling, leaving many to wonder if there had ever really been a siege at all. My feelings about Quezon being besieged, even at the time and now as I look back on it, I never felt that we were besieged in the sense that we were totally cut off. But I also knew we couldn't just get out of our positions and stroll around out in the mountainside either. The Marines and the other armed forces had turned back a strong challenge and could claim a complete military victory. However, the symbolic ramifications of this so-called siege may have told a different story. The Vietnamese were fighting for political reasons, for strategic goals, not necessarily tactical victories. And Khe Sanh was remembered as a siege, and many people in the United States learned the, the wrong lesson from Khe Sanh, thinking that we were on the defensive. It showed us barely winning a battle against an enemy who was attacking us versus us attacking the enemy, bringing the war to an end. Almost 20 years after Vietnam, the United States again found itself involved in a conflict on unfamiliar terrain. This time, it was the sands of the Middle East. During the tactical operations in Iraq, we had to fight against many modern-day fortresses. Those fortresses were in the forms of any tank ditches, bunkers, bunker complexes, and defensive positions built on a grand scale. They had had months to dig holes, dig trenches, set in mines, and we had been briefed extensively on the capabilities of their defense. We expected to see a, a real knockdown drag out fight. Fortunately, through the use of incredibly accurate satellite photos, the coalition forces were able to actually duplicate and practice breaching the Iraqi defenses. We had great overhead imagery of what we were facing. We took that overhead imagery and we sent it back to the deserts of California and they built the Iraqi Siegfried Line in the National Training Center. They then went out there with the very best that they could take to the National Training Center and they practiced reducing that obstacle and going through it over and over and over again until they had it all right. Then they filmed it. Then they sent the film to us in Saudi Arabia as we were training for this thing. Then we built our own Iraqi obstacles using the models that they gave us and the overhead imagery. We built them in the desert and we practiced it over and over and over again. Not against a generic obstacle system, but against what we knew we would be facing in detail. Thanks to such incredible preparation and complete air superiority, the actual ground offensive was executed to near perfection. We expected a, a Siegfried line, but ended up not finding one there. The ease with which coalition forces were able to breach the Iraqi defenses during Desert Storm demonstrated yet again that the reliance upon Maginot Line defenses is outmoded in an age of maneuver warfare. They use the engineers to clear the minefields. They use the engineers to breach the berm. And then the tanks would go through, armored personnel carriers. And then it became a war of mobility. And uh, the Iraqis never could fight a war of mobility the way we fight a war of mobility. The amazing successes enjoyed by the coalition forces and the relative ease with which they broke through the Iraqi defenses raised certain questions about the nature of effective fortifications in the future. Mobility and the ability to hide are going to play a bigger role in the battlefield than to fix something in the position. In the future, with the development of directed energy weapons, lasers and other such devices, we may find ourselves reintroducing a new series of forts and fortresses in order to protect vast areas that are defended with laser weapons. Regardless of the technological advancements to come, there is no doubt that the bitter struggle between the aggressor and the defender will continue.